We're starting off this episode a little different today, plant friends, because I have written you a song inspired by today's episode topic, winter, houseplants and winter. If you're around my age and you're an Ingrid Michaelson fan, you will know, but without further ado, here it is. This is my winter song to you. Your plants might get real blue or enter dormancy. This episode of Beacon in the Night to help your plants not die and welcome in some peace to help your plants survive or maybe even thrive, maybe. <laughs> If you know, you know, that song is Winter Song by Ingrid Michaelson. Plant friends, winter's coming. There's things that can affect our plants in a positive or a negative way, and we're going to break it all down for you and help you thrive in this winter season. Welcome. <laughs> Blue Mangrove Radio. Hello, my sweet plant friends. I hope you've had beautifully planty weeks as per usual. Sorry to be to open this episode so silly, but that song has been in my head as we enter this winter season. Billy and I joke that we live in a snow globe here in the Catskills. We've got these big, beautiful western-facing windows. When it snows, you truly feel like you're like in this little magical snow globe. I'm I'm having all the cozy winter feels. And that song, I was just noodling around with it yesterday and I felt like I had to write you write you a planty version of it. So anyway, winter's coming, plant friends. Winter is here and that can bring lots of turmoil for plant friends. Houseplant parents can really fear the winter, but honestly, it's not a big deal as long as you can really understand the changes that your plants are experiencing, I feel like from a higher level. So a lot of episodes on Bloom and Grow are about kind of zooming out and understanding from a higher level what's happening. So it's not just about what the plant care card says. It's, oh, I actually understand what the difference in light is outside. So this is what I'm going to do. And when we give you this high-level understanding, it's easier for you to apply that knowledge to all of your plant collection instead of feeling like you need to know all of these specific things for each plant that you have, if that makes sense. So this doesn't need to be nerve-wracking, and I'm going to take you through everything you need to know to have a successful winter with your houseplants, because I've lived personally through multiple winters with my plant babies, several winters in our tiny 500-square-foot apartment in New York City, now two winters in our larger homes in the woods, (laughs) in the Catskills, where it's been a little bit of a rougher winter, and I've learned a lot. I'd say through trial and error, right? But there's a lesson in every plant fail, and I'm going to share all the lessons that I've learned with you today, as well as crowdsourcing you guys, the thousands of listeners that I've heard from sharing your tips. Today's episode is a solo episode. It's just me. We're going to kind of go through several different aspects of winter and houseplants, what's happening outside, how that's affecting our houseplants, and tactical things, you know, that you can immediately start doing with your plants to ensure that you don't kill them accidentally the way I have <laughs> in the last couple of, of seasons. Before we dive in, I wanted to give a shout out to our Australian listeners. Bloom and Grow has a very large listener base in Australia, and I feel terrible when I do these seasonal episodes because I realize, yes, it's winter here in the Northern Hemisphere. You guys are going into summer in the Southern Hemisphere. I'm sorry for this, you know, opposites, but we've got plenty of spring and summer episodes if you go down the catalog. And I just wanted to say a special shout out to our Australian listeners. I love you guys so much. Some of my favorite listeners are from Australia, and I hope let's put it into the universe. Let's plant the seed of intent attention that Bloom and Grow comes and does a live taping in Australia in 2023 or even 2024. Okay. So by the end of this episode, I promise you that you will have a larger understanding of how winter impacts our plants and actionable steps to take to ensure that you have a healthy and happy winter for your plants, but residually for yourself. Because when your plants are happy, you're less stressed, right? We've all been there when a plant goes south and then it totally stresses us out for two weeks until we figure out how to fix it or end up having to mourn the loss of that plant. So plant friends, let's dive right into it. High level. Plants don't like winter, right? Uh, Most of our houseplants are tropical houseplants. They're from tropical areas. They like high humidity long days that are filled with sun. Number one, without taking winter out of it, houseplants 
naturally do not thrive in indoor environments that we've created for them, right? On top of that, the winter environment is even harder for them to sometimes survive. So just understand, it's not you, it's them, right? But it is kind of you because it's your responsibility to figure out how to help them stay as happy as possible in winter as they are probably in their peak of their discomfort, I guess, if we want to put it that way. So let's go high level. What's happening? Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However, that drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. If you have the travel bug, if you dream of seeing the cities and plants of the world, I have a great podcast recommendation to add to your listening roster plan, friend. It's called Women Who Travel from Condé Nast Traveler, and it's a podcast for anyone who loves to explore places both close and far from home. Join host Lale Arikaglu, who has a particularly delightful voice and British accent, each week as she shares her 10 years of experience as an endlessly curious and passionate global journalist, as well as the story stories of self-identifying women travelers from around the globe. Though travel and adventure has historically been publicly claimed by men, Women Who Travel creates a space for anyone excited about global issues and traveling. From the depths of the Patagonian wilderness to walks through Europe's oldest cities, Women Who Travel immerses you in the travel experience featuring sound from around the world alongside guest interviews and listener-submitted audio diaries. This tableau of sound brings the inspiration and joy of this community of travelers to wherever you're listening from. Women Who Travel is available now wherever you listen to podcasts. As we move into winter, obviously talking about the Northern Hemisphere, there are a few things that we should understand about the light. Understand that plants use light to make their food. Plants use light to make their food through photosynthesis. So no light equals no food equals dead plants. That is a great rule to live by, especially when, you know, if you ever have a friend that's like, can I put a house plant in my bathroom with no windows? No, because if there's no light, there's no food and your plants, you don't want to starve your plants. That's not nice, right? So, you know, with fertilizer, it can get confusing because it's labeled as plant food. And yes, those nutrients are vital to the plant, but the plant is actually making its food through the light. So... In the winter, the sun, as it moves from east to west, is actually lower in the sky and the days are shorter. So you and your plants are getting less light due to the amount of time that the sun is out and the actual arc that the sun is traveling in the sky. So there's less light volume available to your plants. There's a lot we can dive into in this topic, but I'm going to leave it there if you want to go into DLI, Daily Light Integral. 
But we'll save that deep dive for another day, maybe with Leslie Halleck by my side, because that gets really nerdy. But just know, winter, there's lower light, so it's harder for your plants to make food. That's not bad, right? It's just what's happening. So what many of you guys might experience in your houseplants is as you enter winter, your plants are making less food. They're not having to work as hard. They might drop their leaves just kind of in a self-preservation moment, right? If they can't make enough food to sustain the entire plant, they'll drop some leaves in order to protect their energy reserves, and then they'll grow more leaves later. So know that leaf drop isn't necessarily bad. It's normal in the winter for most plants. Obviously, everything I'm saying, take with a grain of salt because, you know, different species of plants react differently. And we'll dive into that in a little bit. So if you're going into winter and your plants start dropping their leaves, but the top of the plant is overall healthy and it's just those bottom leaves that are dropping, don't worry. It's winter. It's just the plant preparing to go rest a little bit. It's like putting its pajamas on, but I guess it's like getting into its birthday suit. Does that make sense? (laughs) By losing, losing its clothes, losing its leaves instead of um, increasing them. Another thing I wanted to note about light that can also get really confusing is for some people, winter, even though in general there's less light availability, for some people, there will actually be more light in the winter. Because if you have deciduous trees near you where the leaves fall off of the trees, because get this, if you have a house that is surrounded by trees whose leaves fall in the fall and in the winter they're barren, there's more light cutting through those trees because the leaves aren't blocking it, right? So in the summer, your window and your home might be in shade because the light, uh, the leaves of those trees are blocking the sun. But in the winter, if those leaves aren't there, there actually might be more sun coming into your apartment or your home. So every environment, every home environment, and I'm sorry, you hear me say this a million times, but every home environment is a unique little cutie snowflake. And you do have to kind of be a super sleuth and figure out, okay, what is actually happening for me? Because in the winter, some people actually might experience more light than they do. It's rarer, right? But that's just a great example of how um, most plant care advice isn't like one size fits all. And especially with the winter. So another word that I wanted to show you that we learned in the Garden Society last year is this word quiescence. So quiescence is inducing like sleep kind of. It's a quieting if you think quiescence, quieting. So a lot of our plants, as we go into winter, as there's less light, as they're making less energy, they experience quiescence. They get a little quiet. And that's not bad. That's just nature. Some plants experience dormancy when they like totally lights out for a few months before they wake up again. When we're talking about these things, different plants, some plants go dormant. A lot of houseplants don't. Okay, so I want to tell you a story about how many of the houseplants you think might go dormant. I feel like a lot of people talk about your houseplants are going dormant this winter. Don't do this, this, and this. A lot of tropical houseplants don't go dormant. (laughs) And uh, here's an example of when I made an ass of myself (laughs) to Leslie Halleck, my plant botanist friend, but I had an African violet that wasn't blooming. And so I thought that the plant was dormant. And I told Leslie, yeah, my my African violet is dormant. I can't get it to bloom. And she was like, no, it's not dormant. You haven't given it enough light. If you give the plant enough light, it will bloom. But African violets don't experience dormancy. And uh, Leslie never lets me forget that (laughs) moment with her. But just know, like a slowing down is normal. Our plants are just slowing down. They're getting cozy. They're putting their fuzzy socks on. They're getting the cozy blankets and they're tucking in for the winter. And that's totally cool. So knowing that with light, so we're going to kind of go over light watering and fertilizing, and then I'll kind of tell you the things that I do and the things that I would recommend in regards to that. So now that we've covered light, some people I know will do a preemptive prune. So knowing that, you know, if you have a really big plant that will likely lose some leaves in the winter, some people will actually go in. I think Chris from Botanic Tonic talked about this on one of our episodes, but he will actually go in and prune the plant before winter to allow for it to kind of slow down. For me in the winter, I don't do a preemptive prune as much as I will definitely go through my plant collection and remove any leaves that don't look good. Any leaves that I see are turning a little bit yellow. I'm just like, we're going to lose you anyway. So let's like hack you off. 
you don't have to do that, but that is something that that I do and that Chris recommends. If you are growing highlight plants, like if you're living your best Hoya life, your best succulent life, if you've got a fiddly fig tree in your care, um, you might want to supplement the lack of light in the winter with grow lights. That's what I ended up doing way back when I started and then I kind of went crazy and now I have five or six grow lights in my house, but you can supplement with grow lights. So by now, if you've been listening to this podcast for a while, you probably know what a grow light is. But in case you don't, grow lights are fancy lights that have a photosynthetic spectrum that mimics the sun. When I look for grow lights, if you're interested in getting grow lights, I've got tons of recommendations on my website shop. I think it's bloomandgrowradio.com slash shop. I look for white light. You don't want to go purple or red. That's not mimicking the sun to the best of its ability, and it looks weird in your house. Always put them on a timer because you're going to forget to turn them on and off every day. And also for me, I want them to just kind of mold into my design. Uh, Lately, I've been using the Soltec Vita grow bulb. It's just a light bulb that you put into like any light fixtures that you have, and I have a desk lamp as I record this in my office that the Vita grow bulb is in, and then it's keeping my Hoyas happy in a low light area of my office. And if you're curious about all the grow lights that I have, because I have so many in so many different varieties, you can check out, I have a YouTube video with a tour of my grow lights back in my New York City apartment, but it's pretty, it's still pretty accurate. I have a couple more since then, but I still had a lot in New York City. And we'll make sure to leave the discount codes in the show notes in case you're interested in purchasing. Okay, let's talk about watering. In the winter, you may have to water more or you may have to water less. So let's talk about both. There are a lot of factors that you have to take into consideration with water. We're going to go into humidity a little bit more in a bit, but know that with watering, if you are living in a home that has a lot of radiators that kicks out a lot of dry heat, your soil might end up drying out faster than in the summer. So example, my windowsill in my current home, beautiful Western facing windowsill, it gets great unobstructed light. I have to water and I have a lot of tiny plants and tiny pots on the windowsill. And I noticed last winter that I actually had to keep my eye on those plants more in the winter than in the summer because the radiator right below it kicks off so much dry heat that those plants that are also in terracotta pots were drying out a lot faster. Mostly when you look at any kind of like winter houseplant care guide, it's going to tell you to pare back on watering. Generally, that's probably what you're going to do as your plants slow down. They're going to need less water. But basically what I say in the winter is just be mindful as you move into the winter of your plant soil. Depending on your indoor environment, realistically, most of you will probably not have to water as much But this is something that I talk about in my book a lot. But for watering, you shouldn't have a watering routine. You should have a plant care routine where you're checking in with your plants on a daily or weekly basis. But that doesn't mean that you should be watering on the same day every week. Because season by season, your plants are going to need different amounts of water potentially. So high level, most plants don't water them when the soil is already wet. So if you water them in the winter... And normally the next, you know, the next week, whenever you normally rewater your plants, if that soil is damper than it usually is when you rewater, obviously, you know, take a beat and wait. You know, I also think winter can be a time where houseplant parents get really itchy because, you know, your plants are slowing down. You're not seeing as much new growth. You're not plant shopping. You're not, you know, it's, it's harder, right? There's not as much growth going on. But I think winter can be a beautiful time to really double down on your plant care routine and checking in with your plants and getting really mindful and using plant care as self-care and plant care as a mindfulness activity. Because to me in the winter, I actually have to be way more on guard with my plants than in the summer because you're checking for, you know, those watering adjustments. You're you're checking more frequently for pests, which we'll talk about a little bit later. So anyway, that's just my thought kind of on watering in the winter, but you know, be mindful. I know a lot of blogs and a lot of, you know, one size fits all says in the winter stop fertilizing, stop watering, and that's not really the case for for some people. In terms of fertilizing, my rule of thumb for fertilizing is I fertilize when a plant is growing. I also have a lot of grow lights in my house, right? So my office plants that are under the Soltec grow light, they're not going to probably slow down because they're experiencing the same amount of, of 
light. So if I see plants growing, I will fertilize and continue giving it the nutrients that it needs. If you notice that your plants do slow down and experience quiescence, then I would say definitely feel free to pair back on fertilizing. And that is the standard kind of advice everyone gives. But once again, I feel like it's about empowering yourself to kind of look at your plants and and figure out what they need and what you need to do for them instead of just going by the book. Another thing with looking at your plants is don't just assume your plant is dead. Sometimes, you know, I've had alocasia before. My Stephania erecta, you know, has completely like lost all of its leaves and it's basically a pot, you know, with a potato in it right now. My I've had alocasia before where it's a pot with these dead leaves. You can leave those dead leaves on the plant. I mean, trim them if you don't like the way they look, but you can also leave those dead leaves on the plant. And realistically, there might be more growth. If the roots are healthy and um, if what's going on under the soil is healthy, your plant will likely continue to grow in the growing season again. So don't just think that your plants are dead and toss them. If you have a plant that lost its leaves, like a Stephania erecta, I would just check the roots. And if the roots are still healthy, I would keep that little baby, you know, in your houseplant collection until the spring because you never know. If you're not using grow lights, that's totally cool. Just anticipate slower growth. Understand, you know, that you're going to have a a state of quiescence and that's totally great. And you're a fantastic plant parent and I love you still. Okay. Plant shopping. In the winter, like I mentioned, houseplant parents can get a little itchy. Itchy is my favorite word to say. I say there's gardener's itch which happens about March or April when you're so anxious to get back into your garden outside, like you cannot stand it. I experienced gardener's itch so bad last year, but it's this itchiness under your skin that makes you just want to go grow and see something grow. I think houseplant parents get kind of itchy also in the winter because stuff slows down in the houseplant world. I mean, you can refocus on your houseplants, especially if you're gardening outdoors. The Winter can be a beautiful time to really like focus in and spend time with your plants because you don't have other options. So plant shopping can get kind of tricky in the winter. If you want the, if you're experiencing that itch and you want to bring some plants home, I totally get it. I totally hear you. Two years ago, I went in the middle of winter, I brought two alocasias home from the greenhouse. (laughs) I get it. That was like the worst decision I ever made. But here are some things to keep in mind if if you're going to bring plants home. If you're ordering plants online, those plants are going to sit in that box in really cold, rough conditions. They can freeze, right? It takes multiple days for those plants to get to you, and those plants are going to be shivering cold in the shipment. So I would say if you're going to order plants online, buy the winter coverage, pay extra for the plant heater pads. If people are shipping plants in the winter and doing it correctly, they should be including some heat pads or, you know, ensuring that it's like one or two day shipping. But be mindful that if this, if you do do this, you are taking a risk that that plant is going to show up and it might need to get rehabbed. It might need to be, you know, totally tossed out. I sent a plant to someone in the winter last year and, you know, it was with a great company, but it arrived and was like totally frozen. So just know that, you know, it's a little bit riskier in the winter. And so you're going to want to make sure that you're ordering with reputable sellers and that, you know, you're, you're doing the upgrades to make sure that you get a winter shipment, you know, the winter like shipment security or whatever they, most of these plant shops call it. If you do shop in the winter, I would advise going to your local plant shops because at least you can protect that plant from just bringing it from the shop home. Be mindful of how long your plants are outside. If you're leaving them in the car for an extended period of time and the car gets really cold and just know that that plant is leaving the ideal condition. So we know high level, right? When you bring a plant home in general, that plant is leaving perfect conditions in a greenhouse, perfect humidity, 70, 80% humidity, It's getting watered beautifully. It's probably getting pumped full of fertilizer. Then it goes into a plant shop where realistically, it's probably still getting good humidity. It's probably still getting good light. And then you bring it home. That plant already is going through such a transition. To add the fact that you're going to bring it home in the winter, it's going to get a cold shock and your house is probably drier. It's just, it it can just get a little tricky. So if you're going to do it, I hear you. I get the itch. I feel you. But you're going to want to take some extra precautions if you are going to shop for plants in the winter. I would also be super curious for our listeners, if you guys have tips for plant shopping in the winter, leave them on Instagram on the post for this episode because I would be curious to see how you guys kind of overcome that hurdle. 
And now on to humidity, which I think is going to be the most important thing for you to understand how your plants get affected by humidity. Thank you to our incredible episode sponsors, Territorial Seed Company and Espoma Organic. Territorial Seed Company's new spring catalog is now available online and will be in mailboxes soon. Their catalog's kind of a big thing. They have such a wide variety of seeds and plants, plant friends. If you are seed starting this year, you've got to go with Territorial Seed Company. They're incredible. I've used their seeds for the last two or three seasons. I've grown the coolest varieties of stuff that you would never find in you know your local stores. They've got 70 new varieties of plants, including dozens of new flowers, which look gorgeous. And of course, all of your old favorites. I wax poetic about their cherry tomatoes, the blush varietal of cherry tomatoes. Make sure to check out their selection of online exclusives as well, including their new black pepper vine plant and so much more. With over 40 years of experience, Territorial Seed Company has high quality products that you can trust. I use them. I love them. The zinnia I grew of theirs was like the star of my garden last year. Order early and put your mind at ease knowing you're going to get exactly what you want, whether they're the essential seeds, plants, and supplies that you need to have your best garden ever in 2023. And they're offering a discount for the Bloom and Grow community. Code GROW10, GROW10 gets you 10% off your first order. Order now at TerritorialSeed.com with code GROW1010 at checkout. Espoma Organics, how I love you. Plant friends, I hope you know by now, Espoma is a family-owned and operated company dedicated to making safe indoor and outdoor gardening products for people, pets, and the planet. If you need soil, if you need fertilizer, if you need houseplant fertilizer, whatever you need for your plants, Espoma's got it, likely. And as we enter seed starting season, once you get your seeds from Territorial Seed Company, I highly recommend Espoma's seed starting mix. I've used it every year. I've used it to great success. A tip that I've learned through trial and error is to pre-moisten the soil before you plant the seeds. So if you plant the seeds in the dry mix, then when you water it, the water bubbles up. And with seeds, it's all about spacing. And then your seeds move around and then that's a whole thing. So pre-moisten that Espoma seed starting mix, pop your seeds in there. You're going to have great success. You're going to be blooming and growing in no time. And then once you've gotten your seeds started, Espoma will continue to help you grow an incredible garden. They've got an amazing line of outdoor products like Biotone Starter Plant Food, their Plant Tone Fertilizers, and their potting mixes for containers, raised beds, and in-ground. To learn more about their organic indoor and outdoor amazing products, visit Espoma.com to see where your local Espoma dealers are, or click the link in the show notes to go to my Amazon storefront where I have a curated list of all my favorite Espoma picks. Okay, humidity. This is the big one. This is light obviously changes a lot in the winter. Humidity really changes a lot in the winter for <laughs> for several different reasons. For some people, right? Maybe some people don't. If you're like on your humidifier game, you know, maybe this isn't a problem for you, but it's a problem for me, so we're going to dive into it. Okay. So, remember earlier in the episode we did high level plants don't like living indoors, nor do they like living in winter indoors. So when we say our tropical houseplants are used to living in tropical climates, you know, they'll tolerate between 40 to 60% humidity indoors. But if you think about, you know, where they live outdoors comfortably, it's really between 60 to 80% humidity indoors. So that's really different. I remember when I went to Costa Rica on my honeymoon um, a couple years ago, a year ago, sorry, I've only been married for a year, but um, I went to my, my honeymoon in Costa Rica. It was so humid to the point, you know, where you just feel that humidity on your skin in ways that you don't if you live in the States or at least in the Northeast where I live. And I'm seeing these monstera and these snake plants. And, you know, I think we saw a bunch of raptophora, but definitely monstera. I'm seeing these plants thriving in these totally humid conditions. And then I think about my little monstera in its little pot (laughs) and realize, you know, the difference that we're, the difference of conditions that we're putting them in. But anyway understand that, you know, plants really prefer more humidity. They'll tolerate it, right? As we go through that experience of going from the greenhouse to the plant shop to your home, the plant does get conditioned to tolerate and there are plants that are more tolerant than others. But that's what we're thinking about. So I can't recommend enough, if you don't have this already, to get a hygrometer or a hygrometer. I 
routinely mispronounce this word. I I don't really know how it's pronounced, but a hygrometer or a hygrometer. I have a YouTube video where I go over, I ordered a bunch of different ones on the internet and I test them. Basically, it measures the amount of humidity in your house. And when I got them, I was shocked at how low my humidity is. I only got them when I moved out of New York City, and I wish that I had them when I was in New York City. So I'm because I would be so curious to see the difference in humidity. My humidity in my house varies between 20 to 30 percent. My house is dry. I have forced heat. I have radiators blowing off dry heat. My house is dry. Right now, I'm looking at my hygrometer. We're actually up to 45 to 45% humidity, and it's been raining for two days. So whenever it rains, I notice that my my humidity goes up, obviously. But understanding the humidity levels in your house is really helpful because, you know, I don't run humidifiers in my entire house, right? But even if you're not planning on running humidifiers or altering your humidity, it's really interesting to see the, the fluctuation of humidity in your house and the true humidity that you're living in. I started using humidifiers because I was sleeping and waking up so dry it was painful, right? I didn't even, I was like, forget my house plants. I need a humidifier because my throat hurts when I wake up in the morning. But also, you know, that's the first place you can start. If you are someone who has a, a, a drastic humidity drop in the winter, you can supplement with humidifiers. Things to look out for are radiators, forced heat, Dust also is going to get blown around in the winter. Um, So make sure that you're, you know, wiping your plants on if you notice that it gets covered in dust. And be mindful if you put your plants on radiators in the summer, make sure that you're removing them from the radiator before they kick on in the winter. Um, Like I mentioned, you know, I have to be really mindful of my tiny pots on my windowsill in the winter above the radiator because I know that they're going to start drying out faster. You know, I've heard horror stories of my friends who had expensive orchids on their radiator and the radiator kicked on before they knew. And then all of a sudden, all their orchids had just like shriveled and died. So make sure that, you know, you're doing that. I actually just saw um, Camille from Plant Blur did an Instagram where she, the way that she mitigates that is she puts a thick thing of wood on top of her humidifier and then she does deep trays filled with pebbles and water. And I guess the radiator has the water evaporate. To me, that feels like a lot of maintenance, like having to refill the water every day or twice a day. That is an option for you to look at. I don't particularly like subscribe to the whole pebble tray theory. And then one other thing to think about when it comes to air is windows. So in the winter, if you have drafty windows, you can shock your plants. So in the winter, if your windows are drafty, you can seal them up like by putting duct tape on them to make sure that that cold air doesn't come through. Or if you have drafty windows, just move your plants away from the windows. Take your plants out of the windows and move their move them elsewhere so they're not getting, you know, 20-degree shocks. We have a sliding door in our living room that in the summer I put a bunch of plants right up against because it's glass and my monsters love it and they throw off all this new growth. The door is so drafty in the winter, so I've moved my plants away from the door and I've put a little, uh, like, what are those, like, weird bags filled with beans you know, to try and absorb the drafts. So knowing humidity, what haven't we gone over? You're going to tape your windows or adjust your windowsill setups if you need to. Another thing with light that is recommended is, you know, I think a lot of people wash and wipe their windows down in the spring, but I like washing and wiping windows down in the winter because throughout the spring, if we're getting less light, let's make sure that our windows are optimized to let the most light in. So if they've gotten kind of dusty or dirty from the summer, give them a wipe down so that you have, you know, the clearest windows possible to access as much light as possible for your plants. And then a couple tips for humidifiers. If you've been listening to the show, you know that I've recently started using the air care humidifiers in my house, which I love. I feel like in my office, I use them more for diffusing thieves oil than humidity, but the humidity is a nice benefit. Make sure you clean your humidifiers at least once a week. I wipe mine down with white vinegar and water. You do not want mold accruing in your humidifiers. I've had some really scary experiences of running a humidifier when it was moldy and like having my like chest kind of close up. Um, So make sure 
sure you're washing them. And just from be like, you have to refill your water, your humidifiers, right? So I know people who have them on timers and they have two different humidifiers on timers. Like that's really next level. But um, just incorporate your humidifier care and the refills into your plant care routine, right? So if it's a day where your plant doesn't need water, just go and refill, you know, refill your humidifiers instead or give them a clean and add some delicious smelling oils. And I don't know, for me, Thieves oil, um, essential oil, which is a blend of a bunch of different stuff. To me, it's the coziest vibes. Like I can't get enough of it. I've been diffusing it all fall. I'll be diffusing it all winter because it just feels so cozy and almost holiday-ish as well. But anyway, let me know if you want an episode on essential oils and we can dive more into that. Oh, and one other thing about watering I wanted to mention, don't like fully stop watering your plant unless you know that that species of plant needs that. I do highly recommend, you know, doing a deep dive for all your plants to really understand which ones go dormant, which ones don't, you know, which ones you're really going to see that dormancy. Um, And there are some plants that you really have to pare back and not water for a few months, but the majority of the plants don't. And what you don't want to happen is just think that your plant is going, like I've heard stories of people are like, oh, my plants go dormant. It's the winter. I'm not going to water them. They're not plants that actually go dormant. Maybe they've slowed down in growth or they're not growing. Those roots still need water, maybe less water, but they need water. So if you just forget about your plants for three months, don't water them at all. Those roots might shrivel up and die, and then you're going to have a dead plant. So I would say just like really be mindful of watering and which plants need that, you know, drought and which don't. Okay, another big one, pests. So in the winter when plants might be more distressed, that is when pests will come in. I am dealing with pests right now on my Hoya. I think they're thrips. That's actually what I'm going to do after this episode is is go – pest hunting. It's very normal to have pest outbreaks in the winter. Your plants are distressed. They become a vector. So in your plant care routine, as we've been talking about, not having a watering routine and having a plant care routine, make sure that on a weekly, if not daily basis, in your mindful moments with your plants, you're checking the bottoms of their leaves, you're checking their stems, you're checking in with them, and you're making sure that there are no early sites of pests. That might be webbing. If you have mealybugs or thrips, you're going to actually see the pests on them scale. But look for you know the early signs of pests on a routine basis in the winter so you can nip it in the bud before there's like a crazy outbreak that that takes takes out your whole collection or leaves a lot of extra work for you. I was gone for 30 days. I had a pest outbreak on a Hoya and I'm looking at a few different plants that were near the Hoya that I'm like, oh boy, this is going to be an hour of eradicating this little pest outbreak, but it's all good. And then going back to the itch, if you are someone who experiences itch, here are a few things. You know, we've been talking about high level, what's happening outdoors and how it's affecting our plants and how to care for them. I also want to take a moment to say, okay, what's happening outdoors and how should we care for ourselves differently? Last year, I really experimented with playing with the concept of dormancy for myself, playing with the concept of quiescence, quieting for myself, and it was transformative. So many of us feel like because of social media and because of our jobs that we have to go, go, go and be in this season of extreme growth all the time. There is such beauty in allowing yourself quiescence, in allowing yourself some dormancy, And using nature as a natural cue for that, right? In my book, Growing Joy, which is a self-help book about plant care, I talk about having to, you know, acknowledge what season of life you're in. And your personal season of life does not have to equal the outdoor, you know, nature season of life. It's beautiful when they do line up. But, you know, as the days get shorter, as our plants start to slow down, maybe we can slow down, right? What would that look like for you if you were able to slow down in some way? If slowing down means traveling less, if slowing down means minimizing your screen time, right? Maybe as you quiet, you give yourself some quiet time alone with your plants, with yourself, without a screen. But how can you take this concept of dormancy and quiescence and apply it not only to your plants, but to yourself? It was so powerful for me last year. I had run, run, run for like three years and hit a real breaking point with my mental health. I needed to get in some serious therapy. I was completely burned out. I needed real support. And in that time, I thought, you know what? 
I'm going to go dormant. I'm going to allow my social life to go dormant. I'm going to allow some dormancy so I can really look inwards and focus in on my mental health. And now as the winter's coming, I'm really looking forward to another time of of quiet after such a crazy year with the book launch and all the crazy stuff that happened this year. Another thing about quieting and dormancy is we live in this society where everything it's it's so stimulating we're overstimulated we have this tv screen and the phone screen and the emails and this and that and we're being constantly influenced by other things around us and this concept of dormancy and quiescence allows you to get quiet and listen to yourself i mean how many times do we not listen to ourselves how many days do you go when you don't really check in with yourself at all, right? It's all about taking care of others or doing your job or getting up and following your schedule. And you don't even take that moment to check in with yourself, man. It's crazy. Dormancy allows for that, right? Quiescence allows for that. Pairing back. I'll offer you one more on this more mushy topic. But um, last year, Billy and I came up with a commitment to ourselves for 2022, or at least for the winter of 2022, we committed to 10% less of everything. So 10% less traveling, 10% less social engagements, 10% less work. We stopped doing 14-hour work days, 10% less weekend plans in order to just kind of prune back and pair, do that preemptive pruning that we talked about earlier today in order to just allow for some space and some reacquaintance with ourselves and with each other. So if that idea of 10% less for your quiescence and your dormancy helps, I offer it to you. And then, of course, I just want to wrap this episode up. If you do need a jolt of growth, if you do need a jolt of joy in the winter, as I know I do, there are two things that I love to do in the winter for when I do just want that inspiration of of growth and you're not going to see it in your houseplants. I talk about both of these extensively in my book, Growing Joy, in case you want to do them. But um, one is force bulbs indoors. It is amaryllis season right now, plant friends. Oh my God, I love amaryllis so much. I love paper whites. One of our sponsors, Modern Sprout, does a great like paper white kit. It comes in this glass. You set it up and then the paper whites go from these bulbs to stalks to blooms. It's so fun. You don't need a kit to do it. You can go buy some bulbs at your grocery store and put them in a vase that you have and do it really low-fi. But you know, bulbs forced indoors can grow really rapidly and it's like every day there's new roots. There's more of the stem, the blooms. You get the buds. You're watching the buds unfurl. So if you need that quick movement in your life, if maybe – you know, you're in an internal spring or summer, an internal season of growth, and you're seeing the winter and you're like, no, this doesn't align with me. I would say for some bulbs to remind you of that growth and blooming. And then also start seeds. I'm so excited to do more seeds this year. I've had so much fun learning how to start seeds in the last couple of years. We're going to bring more seed starting instructions and tutorials for you in early 2023. Start seeds, man. There is just something magical about watching a seed go from this little brown speck to a little green shoot, and then watching that thing turn into a plant. And a lot of gardeners get really into seed starting in the winter because you get itchy and you need something. So last year I had this manic setup. I just started starting, you know, it it snowed here from November to May. And come March, I was like losing my mind with winter, like kind of going crazy. And so I started start I just started some seeds. I started seeds with no intention of planting them because I thought I was moving, Um, but I started seeds and I was like, you know what? I'll give them away. I'll just give these seeds away. It's a 99 cent packet. Seed packets are extremely affordable, (laughs) especially if you work with territorial seed that has a discount, but seed packets are so affordable and the joy is so incredible. And I was just manically like checking and watering these seeds every day and it was so fun. So anyway... Force bulbs indoors for blooms and start seeds if you need that hit of growth throughout your season. I hope this episode was helpful. I wish you the happiest winter. I encourage you to explore dormancy and quiescence in yourself. Let me know how you're doing that. Uh, We have a really busy December of traveling between Florida and Cape Cod for Billy's family. And I've told Billy, January Mia's going dormant. We're getting quiet. We've got no plans on the books. I'm excited to read and be in all my cozy blankets. We're going to majorly, um, I'm going to cozify our bedroom. We're going to like upgrade our bedroom. I'm going to make it like this really nice cozy place. I'm going to be sitting on my couch reading books. I'm going to 
re- revisit playing the ukulele um, and just like get quiet. So get quiet if you can plan friends. And if you're listening to this before the holidays, I wish you the happiest, happiest, happiest holidays and easy, stress-free travel and time with family. Connect with nature if you can. Whenever you're getting too stressed, if you want to like punch your family member in the face, go take a few breaths outside with nature (laughs) instead, or go walk up to a house plant and have a moment with it instead. It's very helpful. (laughs) And until next time, my sweet plant friends, keep blooming and keep growing joy. Plant friend, thank you so much for tuning in today. If you like what you heard, make sure that you're subscribed to the show on your preferred podcast player so you never miss an episode. And while you're there subscribing, if you wouldn't mind clicking over to the review section and leaving us a review, that would be tremendous. Reviews are so helpful for the growth of the podcast, so thank you so much in advance. If you're looking for more opportunities to grow as a plant parent with Bloom and Grow content, we have so many fun options for you that I want to tell you about. First off, there is the free Bloom and Grow plant parent personality test. It's free, it's super fun, and it only takes three minutes to complete. You take the test and you get your plant parent personality profile. And with that, you get a list of your strengths and weaknesses as a plant parent. And most importantly, my curated list of plants, projects, and podcast episodes that are perfectly suited for you and your planty interests based on your results. The test lives at bloomandgrowradio.com slash personality and can always be found in the show notes of this episode. Okay, plant friends, here's the really good stuff. If you are looking to really grow and up-level your plant parent skills this year, I cordially and proudly invite you to join the Bloom and Grow Virtual Garden Society, rooted in high-quality education and plant community. Plant friends, this is not your grandma's garden society. It's virtual and therefore connects you with plant friends around the world, accessed via our proprietary garden party platform and app, and has the best educational and community-based content and resources available to anyone. When you join, you get immediate access to the entire Bloom and Grow Garden Party platform and app, which is our exclusive space, off social media, algorithm-free, troll-free, with tons of amazing ways to meet other plant parents like you, like regional groups, daily conversation prompts, and even a plant swap space, which is pretty cool. And in addition to that, you get all of the exclusive premium society content, which is three monthly live calls with myself and our horticulturist in residence and beloved Bloom and Grow Radio guest, Leslie Halleck, all in the interest of helping you grow. Leslie hosts monthly Node of Knowledge plant science lectures and monthly office hours, which we call AHAs or Ask Our Horticulturist Anythings, where you can troubleshoot your personal plant collection problems with her. Think about that. You have access to a horticulturist to troubleshoot your personal plant care issues. So amazing. And then I host monthly growing joy calls for community development and to explore the plant care, self-care aspect of plant parenthood. Plus, when you join, you not only get access to the upcoming live calls, but you get full access to all of the replays of previous calls and lectures like the science of plant dormancy or grow lights 101 and beyond. So you can binge your way to your best year yet of plant parenthood. Please come join us. We're having so much fun. Learn more by clicking the link in the show notes or visiting jointhegardensociety.com. For anything else, plant friend, I'm here for you. Feel free to drop me a line when you have an idea for an episode, an event, or even if you're a planty business interested in sponsoring the show. And of course, follow me on Instagram and TikTok for daily planty silliness, musings, and behind the scenes podcast content. Thank you again for listening to Bloom and Grow Radio. It is my true honor and delight to always help you keep blooming and keep growing. Make new plant friends, propagate knowledge, and grow some freaking joy. That's the motto of the Growing Joy Garden Society app and platform, otherwise known as the plantiest and kindest corner of the internet. If you've been an OG listener or a longtime listener, you might also know this app and platform as the Bloom and Grow Garden Party, but with the rebrand, we've rebranded it to the Growing Joy Garden Society. No trolls allowed, kind plant friends only. And if you haven't heard about the society yet, Plant Friend, you got to join. It's my online community that you can access via iOS or Android app or on your computer that I built to connect our international community of plant friends so we can all nerd out together about plants and celebrate our passion for our beloved plant babies. We have members literally all over the world. I'm so in love with this community of sweet plant friends. I can't say enough amazing things about them. But also there's a lot of really cool features about the app you might be interested in. 
There's dedicated hashtags to all sorts of different subsects of planty passions like houseplants, gardening, plant-inspired DIY projects, growing joy, plants and pets, and so many more. There's a plantrepreneur group. So if you're a planty entrepreneur and you want to connect with other planty entrepreneurs, you can join that group to connect and network. There's a plant swap section. Plus, the entire app, and this is my favorite part, is entirely searchable. So say you want to learn more about Hoya, you type the word Hoya into the search bar, and literally every post ever created about Hoya will Will pop up so you can click in, see what other people have been posting about Hoya and learn on your own and crowdsource hair information. It's so cool. But last but not least, it's an amazing way to support the show. Your monthly membership not only goes to sustaining the platform, but it also supports my team of editors, writers, and a community manager that help the world of Bloom and Grow keep growing. So come join us. All you got to do is go to jointhegardensociety.com and sign up for the community plan. Once again, you go to jointhegardensociety.com and click Click the community plan. Hot take plant friends. There is no one right starter plant. There, I said it. And you know what? While I'm at it, there are also no real plant killers in the world. There are just people who have not figured out their right plants for their lifestyle. This is why I created the free Plant Parent Personality Test, because Plant Friend, I want you to get thriving alongside your houseplants as quickly as possible, so I made this cutie little Plant Parent Personality Quiz that's totally free for you on my website to take the guesswork out of building your plant collection effortlessly and joyfully. After speaking to thousands of members in our community, I realized that there are about five key plant parent personalities, each one with their unique set of strengths, weaknesses, and a unique set of plants that thrive under their care. For example, a mindful plant parent, someone who wants to engage with their plants daily, use them in their morning routines. If someone gifted that plant parent a succulent and they watered it every day, that succulent would die immediately. However... That drought-resistant succulent is a perfect match for a low-key plant parent, which is someone who travels, has kids, is busy, doesn't have time to engage with their plants every day. They're looking to engage with their plants more like once a week or once every couple of weeks. In addition, obviously, to understanding your light and basic plant care that we provide on this podcast, Happy Plant Parenthood is all about discovering your personality and then picking the right house plants to go with it. It's that simple. No more stressing over your collection. So what plant parent personality type are you, plant friend? All you got to do to find out is take my free quiz on my website and let me know. You can access it at growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality. After taking the test, you'll get an email with a list of plants, podcast episodes, and planty projects that I think would light you specifically up like a full spectrum grow light. So once again, that's growingjoywithmaria.com slash personality for your free plant parent personality test results. Mm-hmm. 